My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network, which is a service of OCTO. Um, and we're very pleased to have you here today uh, to talk about financing coral reef conservation with tourism-related tools. And we have David Myers of Conservation the Conservation Finance Alliance on to speak about that. Um, I also wanted to let you know who everyone else is. Um, we also have Ray Evrard, who is co-hosting uh, also with OCTO, and we have Sherry Wagner who is um, representing the Reef Resilience Network, which is co-hosting this webinar as well. And we wanted to let you know that this webinar is sponsored by ICRI. ICRI uh, stands for the International Coral Reef Initiative, and it's an informal partnership which strives to uh, preserve coral reefs and related ecosystems around the world. They're sponsoring today's webinars as part of its uh, collaboration with Conservation Finance Alliance for promoting innovative financing for coral reef conservation. Um, just a couple other tidbits as we get started. So for the format of the webinar, we'll have a presentation by David, and then we'll have uh, time for questions afterwards. Um, you, you can ask the questions by typing the questions into the, the Q&A panel or the chat panel um, of your user interfaces, so we can, and then we'll relay the questions to David. Um, in addition, if there's questions that we aren't able to get to, there's going to be um, a, a discussion forum on the Reef Resilience Network um, forum, and information about how to join that is going to be posted at the end of the webinar. So the continued discussion um, on another forum. And uh, just to let you know, there'll be a, a, an additional coral reef financing webinar on October 2nd and 3rd. Um, it'll cover conservation trust funds and public-private partnerships. And we'll send out information about that uh, webinar to you all um, in, in the few weeks when we, we've finalized all the details. So anyway, that was a long intro, and I'll turn it over to David now. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, Again, uh, my name is David Myers. I'm the executive director of the Conservation Finance Alliance, which is a, a global network for conservation finance practitioners and experts. And um, I'll show a slide at the end to, uh, if you want to uh, join the network, please do. Um, I apologize uh, if the internet uh, connection is, is not so good as we go forward, but um, hopefully it'll be stable enough for the presentation. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, financing coral reef conservation and management with tourism related tools. And this is part of a series of, of, uh, of presentations that, that we've been giving and um, look forward to, uh, to the questions afterwards. So I'm gonna start with some in in introductory issues, main issues, uh, talk a little bit about uh, site planning and tourism planning. And then I'll cover a few different tools in detail, site entry and activity fees and tourism concessions. Um, those are the main focus of the presentation. Then I'll talk a little bit about uh, different governance approaches, public private partnerships, tourism taxes, volunteerism, and, um, and philanthropy. So um, some of the main issues, uh, you know, coral reefs, as everyone knows, are under severe threat, um, global warming, um, pollution, overfishing, um, and, uh, and all, all the, the local impacts on coral reefs make them less resilient uh, in the face of climate change. And uh, in most cases, almost all cases, there's insufficient funding to meet the conservation management needs. Um, the, when you look at the different financing tools, uh, there's quite an array of them. New ones are emerging all the time and it may seem quite overwhelming. Um, often local or national capacity is quite limited for implementing these tools. Um, so, um, what would be useful is, is, is a process or a framework for evaluating options and for understanding some of these tools uh, in more depth. And so this presentation um, really will focus on some of the tried and true tools which are related to tourism. Um, some of this work um, is uh, built on a report that was done uh, at the end of last year and is available on the Conservation Finance Alliance website called Finance Tools for Coral Reef Conservation. I highly recommend um, downloading that report. It, uh, it's kind of a working guide on, on some of these finance tools. It does go into some of the more innovative tools. We gave a presentation on this uh, a few months ago, which you could uh, get access to um, on the site. And um, uh, it's really a good resource. So um, I highly recommend that. And in that presentation, in that uh, document, we covered a whole range of different uh, finance tools, including those 
with quite high ease of implementation, such as donations, philanthropy, um, you know, government finance, which is uh, really important, some of the tourism related tools, um, and then some of the more medium and uh, more complicated uh, tools like bonds and biodiversity offsets and, and everything provided on the list here. Um, just as a reminder of where you know, protected areas own revenues or site-based revenues uh, fall within the sources of financing, um, this comes from, a, from a, a, not a comprehensive OECD report, but uh, at least quick analysis uh, replicates what we see in a lot of terrestrial protected areas is that government funds form a large percentage of, of finance for protected areas, for example. Um, and uh, these are for NPAs. Uh, um, so between government funds and donors, it's the, it was the majority of financing and, and own revenues came in at about 17%. So the, a lot of the, the revenues I'm talking about today are only part of your finance mix for your in specific site for a coral reef. Um, however, there are some marine protected areas um, that are able to, to practically self-finance through, through tourism related fees because they're high, such high levels of tourism. So um, now, um, there's a lot of benefits of tourism for, for conservation. There's a lot of challenges as well, but some of the benefits include uh, building a constituency of support for the conservation of nature and culture um, through you know, private sector and, and other partnerships, actively contributing to conservation through involving visitors in both management tasks and also direct contributions. Um, it helps justify political support and better funding for management by recognizing the importance of, of nature and tourism for both local and national economies. Um, and if it's done well, you can ameliorate the, the tourism impacts through the planning through and, um, and damage from them and others. Um, the, uh, there's also a chance to enhance social and cultural benefits um, by providing interpretive services and educational opportunities, um, which is becoming more and more important um, as you know, people are more and more removed from nature. And um, it helps communities near the conservation site understand and, and better tolerate uh, um, management approaches, um, as well as uh, stimulating local economic linkages. Some of the feasibility issues that, that should be considered are, are the following. Um, you want tourism to have a, or have the potential to provide a net positive impact um, on the site management. Um, and now in certain cases, the, the tourism pressure could be so high that the, the site or the site so fragile that, that tourism is not an ideal source of revenue. Um, this uh, is specifically an issue around coral reefs. If you don't manage the impacts well, your the, the entire conservation value you're trying to protect it could be lost. Um, also, you want to make sure revenues are greater than costs. This make, makes perfect sense, but I mean, you want to include all of the, the costs, infrastructure, um, trying to manage the risks and, and impacts and things like that. Um, demand is such a huge issue, you know, uh, and, and it, um, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, it's whether there's tourism demand is, is dependent on site location, various aspects of attractiveness, accessibility, um, proximity to other tourist destinations, um, the quality of your marketing campaign, issues such as national security, political stability, things like that, um, and um, you know whether there's whether there's existing uh, local tourism business infrastructure, hotels, things like that. So all these need to be considered, um, as well as the, the issue of whether you know, the managers and staff have sufficient capacity to the legal and administrative framework also must uh, allow the site to, to generate the revenue and to retain revenue. Oftentimes, uh, revenue from tourism will go back to central treasury. That's often returned back to protected areas through government um, support and, and, and budgetization, but uh, it's really important to make sure that that money um, goes through back to the to managing. So some of the challenges and safeguards uh, can be grouped into um, you know, managing the revenues for conservation, making sure that those revenues go back, and of course, managing tourism to, to minimize the negative impacts. So there are, um, in terms of methodology of, of um, this is quite general, you know, to try to uh, understand, uh, you know, and develop a, a 
tourism in a site that, that for example, doesn't have it or where you want to expand it. You start with a, a scoping phase um, to just see if, if, you're, if this is the right thing. Then um, if you want to move forward, you do a detailed feasibility study. Then there's the design phase um, where you plan out all of your interventions. Uh, then, of course, implementation phase. And, um, and then you want to do monitoring, evaluation, and adaptive management um, as you go forward. The site should have two plans in place, at least um, a management plan, which uh, lays out the overall management goals, involves uh, all the scientific elements and, and uh, things like that to achieve the, the, the goals of the site. And then a business plan is highly recommended as well. Um, that explores your, your revenue options, looks at uh, the development costs um, for implementing the, the tourism and, and the management plan, usually over a five to 10 year period. Um, that should include all of your costs, salary, equipment, things like that, and including some marketing expenses. So um, you may also want to include a, a site tourism plan, although that could easily be part of the business plan or the management plan. And for the for you know tourism planning, you want to look at you know what are your tourist assets, um, what are the current national and local tourism circuits, um, what are your infrastructure needs and availability, who are your key stakeholders. What are the social and economic values and beneficiaries um, of those values? Um, this often helps identifying the key stakeholders and partners. What are your management needs and capacity? Of course, your financial needs and especially startup financial resources. So you may it may look like it, it makes sense um, from an ongoing basis, but you're going to make sure you, you need to make sure that you have adequate startup financial resources to start. Uh, we highly recommend business planning for, for coral reefs and associated protected areas. A business plan is a document that uh, is developed through consultation and analysis. Um, the process of developing that document is, is almost as important as the document itself by engaging key stakeholders and, and building um, commitment and engagement throughout the process. It will summarize the entity's plan to achieve their objectives for both sound management and financing, and it can be written for different organization types, protected area, NGOs, community-based organizations, conservation trust funds, or of course, uh, businesses, which is where uh, the business plans uh, originated. Now, I mean, it's in a style that, that could uh, attract investors or, or donors, and um, so that's the goal. Here's a, an outline of a business plan. We, we covered this a little bit in the previous presentation. So if you want to get more information on that, either download the guide or go back to the previous presentation, but just give you an idea of what a business plan would, would look like. Okay, so now we're going to go into some of these specific uh, finance solutions or mechanisms. And um, just as a, a background, um, when you're looking at, a, at a, any kind of finance mechanism or solution, you want to, to include all the different elements of it, and it can include multiple instruments. Um, so you often have, in many cases, a finance source, um, someone who's the source of the payment. Um, in the case of tourism, often it's the tourists themselves. And, um, and then you have uh, different instruments that could pass through an intermediary or um, could pass directly to beneficiary or recipient. For example, if the beneficiary or recipient is the, is the site manager, um, just an entrance fee might go straight to that site manager. Um, intermediary could be a, a concessioner, a concessionaire, or a, a tourist operator, things like that. And then the beneficiary recipient will will take certain actions that will result in the conservation outcomes that you're seeking. And then there's a, a, a loop back with monitoring and evaluation. So that's the basic structure, and we'll just cover um, that in, in a few of these different solutions. So some of the basic tourism uh, finance solutions include entrance fees. These are fees charged to tourists for access to or use of facilities inside a protected area or a natural site of interest. Activity fees, which uh, we consider separate from entrance fees, these are charged to tourists to participate in a recreational activity in a protected area or natural site. Um, so it could include scuba diving, snorkeling, camping. So you, these are in addition to entrance fees. And then there's other types of park-based fees, uh, licenses, special use fees for say filming, things like that, that, uh, that go beyond just uh, sort of standard activities and uh, could include accommodation, sale of products, things like that. And then we'll talk um, in some detail about concessions. Um, 
which are the right granted by government, a company, or the controlling body of the site to undertake tourism-related operation in a protected area or a natural site, usually in exchange for a fee. And there's two types of concessions. We'll cover both commercial concessions and management concessions. And then visitor taxes, which um, are differ from fees in that they're, they're applied more generally. Oftentimes the money goes straight to uh, government treasury um, and, and are not necessarily tied to specific services. Um, and finally, we'll just talk very briefly about uh, volunteering and uh, you know, donations from tourists and how you could capture some of that revenue. So starting with uh, entry and activity fees, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the finance source is gonna be the tourists, but it could also be the tour operators themselves. Um, they're gonna pay an entrance or, or an activity fee to say park management. Um, could be a, a conservation trust fund as well, or, or government, which then either through grants or directly will um, finance park management actions, um, which result in uh, hopefully ecological integrity, but also it's important to note uh, tourist satisfaction is one of the goals. And, um, and then through tracking the impact of, uh, of the um, actions, um, tourist satisfaction is a really great way to, to promote sites. So when, when a tourist uh, has an excellent experience, they will rapidly share that on social media and uh, word of mouth marketing is, uh, is really important for, for tourism development. Now fees can have multiple objectives and it's important to balance the income generation with, with public access to a public good. You know, coral reefs and, and protected areas are are public goods, they're important for a range of, of benefits. And so you wanna design your fee system with the multiple objectives in mind. Um, tiered fees, for example, um, are, are used where you can create uh, low cost fees for say local school children or um, maybe charge in some cases they uh, you can charge uh, international visitors more than local visitors because you want to encourage local visitation to build up interest and commitment towards those sites um, and then you know some people that use the site more often you know maybe you want to uh, to provide uh, ease, ease of access to those sites again to just maintain good relations with communities um, things like that in the case of coral reefs um, this uh, is a strong uh, impetus to come up with different structures for fishing communities and, and local communities for, for access to the different sites. You want to balance the, you can use fees to balance the, the, the visitor numbers with impact on ecosystem. Uh, this is not a straightforward approach, but in general, you can understand that if you raise the fees, um, you're going to discourage certain types of users from coming in. And um, the, uh, um, in many cases, you could you could have an exclusive site by having very high fees, but um, the reaction of visitors to changes in fee levels is going to depend on what's called um, price elasticity uh, or the elasticity of demand. And um, this is an economic term that uh, that refers to you know how much uh, change in price is going to influence the number of people that want to uh, spend the money to come. Um, so that has to be analyzed along with um, you know the comparing alternatives for uh, different sites. If you raise the price too high, people will go to a different site, and so you'll, you'll lose money. Um, you also want to um, you know, make sure that you're collecting enough fees to maintain the system that collects the fees and to maintain or build the infrastructure that you need to manage the site. So here are some, some general practice standards for entrance and activity fees. Um, as I mentioned before, the fee system should be part of a robust protected area or site management plan. The um, uh, fee pricing uh, should be based on a systematic financial assessment. As I mentioned, both the costs, are you satisfying the costs? Is it a profitable approach? Um, but also um, what's, what's the impact on, uh, on all the social and ecological missions of the site? Um, targeting marketing campaigns, they can help attract regular flow of visitors. Um, think about facilitating local ownership of the system and the revenues collected. Um, and this can be reviewed every two years. Institutional capacity to, to manage effectively the site and the, the, the fee system should be established early on. 
Um, strong communication strategy will help build acceptance among the local communities, making sure they understand uh, why the tourists are coming, um, the fact that they're, they're paying money, um, where that, that, that money goes, so the retention of revenues by, by particular agencies provides really important management incentives, um, but also um, local incentives and, and participation um, in planning and management um, can be reinforced by community revenue sharing agreements and uh, things like that. And also it's important, as I mentioned earlier, um, to recognize that, that uh, revenue from, from entrance fees are part of a divorce, a diverse portfolio for revenue sources and you should not rely only on one type of revenue source, but try to have a, a, a diverse mix of different sources. Um, now I'd like to move to, to tourism concessions. Um, so this is a, uh, I think people are, are quite familiar with, with concessions, but it's where, again, the, the original finance source is, is the tourist or tour operators or the concession, you know, um, that, that bring the tourists into the site. Um, the concessionaire provides uh, tourism services and um, collects money from the tourists. Um, in exchange for those services, they pay often a concession fee to park management or to government or whoever is owning the site or controlling the site. And, um, and then um, the park management or whoever is actually operating the site will, um, will take certain action activities, again, seeking ecological quality and tourist satisfaction. And the economic model I didn't mention before for the, for the um, entrance fees is this very similar. Um, where the user pays for these recreational services, but also for concessions, you can get um, efficiency through outsourcing. In some cases, the uh, a, a for-profit or a non non-profit um, entity <clears throat> could be more efficient than a government entity at managing the site, and um, and so there's a, a cost savings or an efficiency there that uh, is uh, very important and, and should be considered as an objective. There's two types of tourism concessions in general, um, although there's a bit of overlap between the two, um, commercial concessions and management concessions. And um, for commercial concessions, a concessionaire pays a fee for the right to undertake a specific commercial operation in a protected area in accordance with the user pays principle. So these could be uh, you know, diving sites, um, guided tours, snorkeling restaurants, a range of different uh, services that are provided um, for tourists within a site or a protected area. Um, otherwise, there's also management concessions, which is where a concessioning authority outsources responsibility for management and conservation of a protected area or other natural site to a concessionaire with greater capacity, more efficiency, things like that. This is usually in the form of public and private partnerships. And there's different kinds of concession models. I'm gonna go quite quickly through these different ones. Um, and uh, the, um, there's some overlap, um, but as you'll see, there's, it's important to kind of understand what the differences are and um, plan your, your concession strategy based on uh, the appropriate uh, model. So in general, a concession is where a concessionaire pays a fee for the rights, um, often over a long term to design, build, and manage tourism facilities. So accommodations, restaurants, shops. Um, and uh, here, often the concessionaire takes responsibility for all the initial investment and the ongoing management. There's some examples of uh, terrestrial uh, places, but also a lot of um, you know, hotels on remote islands, things like that. Um, uh, for example, the Tanzania Ch Chambi um, protected area, is, a, is like a private hotel, but also uh, taking full responsibility for management of the site. So that's a combination of both a management concession and a commercial concession. Um, the uh, a lease type agreement is where a concessionaire pays a rental fee to lease land. And this is maybe for a, a medium or, or, or shorter term and with existing facilities. Um, this could be the case for, for, in many cases, there's telecommunication infrastructure, but also where there's an existing hotel, an accommodation, restaurant, um, and uh, things like that, where the concessionaire will come in and, and lease the operation, assume full operating responsibility, and um, usually the concessioning authority retains the, the full responsibility for, for uh, the capital 
expenditures and maintenance of the, of the site. Permits are more temporary. They could be up to uh, 10 years. Um, and this gives access to the concessionaire to do certain activities, um, guided walking, canoeing, diving, um, things like that on, on site in exchange for a fee. Um, and the tourism examples uh, for, for PIPA, for example, on the Phoenix Islands, uh, the Phoenix Island protected area in Kiribati. Um, then licenses, um, they're for, they give access to certain privileges that without that authorization would constitute a legal act. So for example, license to do sport fishing, um, or in some cases, uh, take a dive boat to certain area. It requires due diligence from the competent authority. Um, and the example here is, uh, is you know, tour vessels in, in Galapagos National Park. And then finally, um, management contract. These are more um, uh, where the concessionaire enters into a long-term agreement to manage the land or existing facilities. It could include responsibility for both operations and maintenance. Um, the concessioning authority often remains responsible for all investments. Um, leaves um, rather than pays a fee. So the, this could be a, a site where um, they have the services that they want to and so they actually subcontract out the management of different facilities to, uh, to allow, um, uh, in this case uh, for Bonaire for example, um, enforcement, education, maintenance, and research. Um, and then finally, um, you know, service agreement um, where concessionaire receives the right to manage protected are usually responsible for all the investments and main operational expenditures. Um, however, the, the concessionaire here is, is often granted the right to collect entrance and activity fees, which they can then use to finance the conservation activities. And the example given here is um, a public-private partnership with the government of the Dominican Republic for co-management of a large protected area in DR. I'll go into a little bit more detail here is with uh, uh, an NGO called Blue Finance, which is uh, using the shared governance for marine ecosystems. And um, they are working in different areas. Um, and the, the model is the, is the following, um, that the government creates a, works with, creates an agreement with an NGO or, um, or a special purpose entity that could be created, which is a, could be a partnership from different organizations, NGO, private sector, um, often engaging local stakeholders and um, you know, having a very specific responsibility to the government to take care of certain management activities. Um, those activities then are implemented for the protected area um, in this case, uh, through a co-management committee that oversees these activities that involves both government, civil society, private sector partners, um, putting in place annual work plans, monitoring and financial reviews. And then the protected area is, is managed through these actions with the goal of improving ecosystems, uh, enhancing community livelihoods, um, assuring um, spatial, uh, marine spatial planning is, is taking place and uh, good zonation monitoring and of course support to tourism activities. And uh, the government oversees um, whether or not the, this uh, consortium is, uh, is implementing the management agreement through the, through, uh, correctly. So um, you have this uh, shared governance type uh, of approach where um, it's a in this, in this case, it's a tenure renewable agreement. There's annual work plans. Um, the NGO is covering all these costs of equipment, operations, and personnel. Um, in some cases, there's a, a, an annual fee paid back to the government, um, but there's um, the rights, as I mentioned, to, to charge these user fees, which is how the system is, is functioning. Um, and uh, for the government, this is really great because they can have a well-managed site with a very little uh, additional cost um, to, to, they don't have to bring on public debt, they don't have to allocate public budget, things like that. They also are not transferring the, the property to a private uh, entity, but they're just providing a concession, a management concession. And of course the MPA, if it's well managed through this approach, um, is uh, in better shape. And so there are so many uh, sites that, that this could work for, um, but it does require a long, uh, complicated process to build uh, 
awareness and build uh, commitment and, and collaboration with the different entities involved. Um, in, the, in the case of Blue Finance, they, they work with impact investors um, to provide the initial funding for the site. And, uh, and as I mentioned, they're working in Dominican Republic, but also um, other sites in the Caribbean and Southeast Asia, uh, nine countries or, or more have uh, pro projects in process, in preparation. Um, so there are standard practices, again, for concessions. These are, I'm gonna just go through these very quickly. Um, to make, the first is, is really important. You make sure you put conservation first and um, note that, that not all areas are suitable for tourism and, and should not be uh, turned over, you know, or used for concessions. Um, you wanna value and make sure you maximize the wider benefits of tourism, job creation, local revenue, um, obviously striving to make tourism sustainable from, from the beginning through the end, um, important engagement of local communities, um, making sure that there's market viability early on to ensure that the operations are, are sustainable and profitable. Of course, um, developing stakeholder awareness and strong engagement from, from the beginning and, and maintaining that throughout is essential for your communication strategy. Um, assure that you have a sound concessions framework um, that includes all the legal and regulatory structures uh, in place. Oftentimes, they're not in place at the beginning, so it's important to, to establish them. Um, rely on robust site management plans, um, selecting the appropriate concession model, as I mentioned, uh, as we went through those models, um, transparent and clear procurement procedures to make sure that the deal is balanced, that the investor is qualified, and um, that the, the organization that's implementing the, the site is, uh, is viable and, and sustainable. Um, equitable contracts that protect the interest of both parties. In, in the case where a contract is too favorable to one party, often that results in, in challenges later on. Um, managing the contracts well um, and if establishing uh, risk management by identifying and monitoring those risks um, throughout the whole um, stakeholder engagement, site assessments, regular reporting, and, uh, and ongoing monitoring. Um, and then, of course, monitoring and evaluate the progress to continually learn and improve the, the, the management of the site. Okay, I'm going to just uh, uh, cover a few things uh, now quite quickly, um, and, then, and then we'll get to some questions and answers. Um, the first is governance types. So these are uh, different uh, IUCN governance types. Um, a is, of course, a uh, standard where government manages a site. B is kind of shared governance. C is private governance, where individuals, a nonprofit or a for-profit organization take over the site. And D is uh, governance by indigenous peoples and local communities. And so one of the first steps is trying to identify what's the most efficient uh, governance type for the site. Um, by choosing the appropriate uh, approach, you can improve cost effectiveness and efficiency, um, you know, allocating to the private sector activities that the private sector does best. Um, and, um, and in many cases, directly reducing um, the, the cost of, uh, of management. So, or or um, uh, reducing poaching by engaging the communities, for example, in the management of the site. Um, the next area here is, is tourism taxes. And uh, taxes, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, are um, fees that tend to not be associated with direct services. They, they tend to go straight to government treasury um, and uh, then are allocated or distributed afterwards. Um, examples are airport taxes, uh, departure taxes, hotel bed taxes often go to um, you know, tourist agencies, but there are opportunities for um, some money going back to conservation or cruise or airline tickets. So um, a lot of times taxes are tend to be invisible. If you can tag them on to uh, uh, an airport uh, ticket, then um, people don't uh, don't necessarily see them. They're often collected by through private businesses and then remitted to government. So in some cases, uh, taxes, uh, for example, Belize, there's a there's a, a tax of, upon entry that goes to uh, to a conservation trust fund that that helps finance protected areas. Um, as well um, in Blau, there's a, there's a type of system as well where money is going to uh, finance conservation. So there's definitely opportunities there. And the last um, approach uh, I'll mention is, uh, is volunteering. This is a growing area. 
also called volunteerism, uh, where you can get volunteers to come in and assist with protected area management research, uh, you know, coral reef monitoring, for example. Um, this is a combination of, of volunteers providing direct financing to a site and also donating their time. Um, it really can help promote the site. It's something that, that is useful for areas of, um, that, are, that are quite remote or undeveloped. Um, if you can get tourists to come out and, um, and volunteer, um, that builds the knowledge of the site. It helps you develop the different uh, tourist uh, opportunities. For example, for coral reefs, it helps you identify where ideal dive sites are that um, are good for development and where you should try to keep boats away, for example. Um, and it can uh, cultivate, uh, you know, local support and commitment to conservation. So you'll get a copy of this uh, uh, presentation in PDF format that will be available um, for download. So I've included a whole range of uh, additional resources that you can look up here. These are um, some of them quite comprehensive reports in addition to the, the guide that I mentioned uh, early on. And uh, with that, I'm going to end and we'll open it up to questions, but I just want to give a shout out to the, the Conservation Finance Alliance, my organization, where um, you can get uh, conservation finance news, uh, become a CFA member, sign up for the newsletter. And I wanna thank all of our, of our partners here, which you can see down below. And um, back over to you, Sarah. Okay, thank you, David. Um, uh, Sherry, did you wanna unmute and talk about the discussion forum? Yeah, should we do that now before the yeah. questions? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. This is Sherry Wagner. I'm the program coordinator for the Reef Resilience Network, uh, which is a global network of managers, practitioners, and experts, and hopefully some of you on today are part of the network. Um, after the webinar, um, we will post questions if there's some that we don't get a chance to get to with our allotted time today. We'll post them in the forum, and we encourage you to go register. You'll get a... Um, uh, in email when your account has been approved, if you haven't signed up already. And then on the main forum, you'll see a discussion uh, thread for this webinar. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Sherry. Um, David, we'll start with this question. Um, to what extent does tying conservation funding to the success of the tourism economy encourage behaviors or developments um, such as airport or hospitality infrastructure that might impact local and global coral reef health? Right, that's a, a great question. It's something that, that needs to be managed um, actively. And, and so in your you know, scoping and feasibility, um, it's important to try to identify what the you know different sites, uh, tourist sites uh, are likely to be. Oftentimes they evolve um, naturally. You know people like find places, um, and and you want to try to identify them and control access as, as best you can, um, so that uh, you don't have too many uh, tourists coming, um, and that you can control those access, uh, control the numbers. Um, but some sites are just, uh, you know, too fragile. And, and the way that um, some uh, tourism sites are, have developed, um, you do get, you know, this mass tourism, which puts a, a huge strain on it. And so um, you need to work with, with government regulatory agencies, you know, need to work with the tourist associations. Um, you know, it, it's in some places they've tried to have, ex, you know, uh, high fees to make it exclusive, exclusive hotels. But it, you know, it, when the tourism demand is, is so high and it's really growing a lot um, in, in Asia, especially, um, you uh, have a real challenge managing these sites. For example, Thailand just, uh, you know, made uh, put off limits uh, one of their big uh, beach sites in, in, in PP Islands um, near um, Phuket, and uh, um, you, the the I don't know if you, people saw a picture, but there's like so many boats coming to, to visit uh, PP Island and all these different sites, it's really hard to manage it. And um, where certain sites are excluded, people find other sites. So it's really important to, to have a, a master plan for tourism, to work with, with all the different agencies and the tourism operators to, to try to maintain these sites, because if they're overused and damaged, you lose so much value. But I agree, this is a, a huge uh, challenge and something that uh, really needs to be done in, in uh, partnership and collaboration. Okay, thank you, David. 
Um, we had another question. As someone was wondering about the applicability of the techniques um, you discussed to coral reef conservation in general, um, including restoration, reduction of land-based sources of pollution and more, as opposed to just coral reefs that are in MPAs, since that's a, a, rel a small fraction, well, I, don't know about, I don't know the exact size, but a fraction of coral reefs worldwide. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, as I, there are so many um, threats to coral reefs um, and tourism uh, as a revenue generating uh, mechanism can only provide uh, benefit to, to, to certain of those threats. Um, you need to look at the site in, in an integrated manner and um, you know there's so many other tools that, that conservation finance can provide to try to say reduce uh, agricultural runoff by you know, producing oftentimes subsidized fertilizers and things like that, um, the tourism have nothing to, nothing to do with. But the one thing it can do is if you um, uh, have tourism and can show the economic benefits of tourism, then you can um, convince government and other stakeholders that the health of the coral reef is, is really important. But again, tourism is only one type, you know, one sort of category of tools that, that help finance coral reefs and help help manage them, but um, there's other uh, threats that, that we'll need other finance solutions to address. Uh, I'm sure that was a, not a complete uh, answer, but um, as I say, this, that can be quite, it can be quite complicated and there, there are a lot of other tools. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Um, we're getting really good conversation and lots of great questions. So I'm trying to, uh, we won't be able to hit them all, but uh, we, we can get to a number of them. Um, there was a question as, are there any countries, or what countries are best for these kinds of conservation ecotourism approaches? Are some better than others, or what sort of conditions do you need? Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've not seen a, a kind of review of different countries' approaches. Um, the, uh, so I, I really, you know, don't want to, uh, Name names at this point uh, based on limited information, but um, you know where tourism tends to work the best, you you have strong governance. Um, this is such a prerequisite for for many um, conservation finance tools, and um, you know obviously Costa Rica is always cited as a you know a great destination, well managed ecotourism, things like that, but. Um, but basically, you know, good governance, the ability, the rule of law, um, contracts being respected, and things like that um, uh, are, are essential. In places where where that's not the case, um, you do have the risk of uh, of you know private interests or um, you know uh, mass tourism uh, just coming in and, and dominating and destroying areas. So. Um, but uh, if anyone has a uh, knows of a study that's looked at that, I'd be very interested in seeing that. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Um, there was a question about how uh, do you does Conservation Finance Alliance work with groups, or what are the mechanisms for that? Um, we are uh, we're an awareness raising, um, capacity development, and innovation organization we try to uh, encourage knowledge sharing and information on conservation finance tools um, we, we do uh, we, we are open to working with groups so just reach out and, and let us know um, we don't have budgets to do uh, to come in and do training but we're trying to, to establish that okay thank you um, let's see uh, another question uh, so many. Okay. Can you mention any successful examples of how licenses for fishers have been used in MPA management financing? I assume this raised questions about the scale of the fishery, how to ac secure access and gear regulation. Well, um, so of course, um, marine, marine protected areas and different sites um, are almost entirely multiple use areas. And so they always include, for them, yeah, almost always include um, uh, access to certain fisheries resources with uh, limitations on um, equipment and, and area access and things like that. Um, 
So that doesn't fall into the tourism area, but just in general, um, you know, general uh, site management. But uh, in terms of tourism, you do get uh, fish licenses from, from um, sports fishing, and that can provide a really strong uh, revenue generating resource. When you um, when you have sites, uh, you know, Costa Rica's got a, a very strong uh, uh, sport fishing license uh, industry. Um, other countries are starting to, to develop that. It's uh, you know, they're all almost entirely catch and release uh, for certain species. Um, but, um, but yeah, there's great opportunity there. And, and many, in many places, this is not, you know, monitored, not really, uh, no revenues are captured. So it's a great opportunity. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Um, another question, what tools can be used to value entrance and activity fees for tourists. Um, for example, would it be willingness to pay surveys, or, or how do you how do you set those? Right. Um, this is a great question, and um, my colleagues at the Conservation Strategy Fund would say absolutely, willingness to pay is is um, is uh, essential. It is um, where you have uh, some some money to do a willingness to pay study. This is all often very enlightening, um, but. Uh, what in, in practical terms, oftentimes you'll get um, figures for willingness to pay much higher than what you'd expect, and and often um, because people don't actually have to put the money out, um, they're they're more likely to say that they're willing to pay more than they're actually willing to pay. So, what you the, for us the best practice is to compare alternative sites, um, choose a, a an amount that that seems reasonable given the the, the local economy, uh, making sure that again that you're covering your costs, um, and then track the impact. If you're going to double the price, you want to make sure you're tracking the number of visitors before and after things like that um, to uh, to see what the impact is. Um, so in many cases, if people travel traveling long distances, they're going to be relatively price insensitive for an entrance fee, and so it's possible that you could raise uh, raise the price. But remember. Uh, tourists want to see the value for what they're paying. So even if a, a diving fee is, is $4, um, which is, you know, could be rather, rather low because each tank dive is, is, you know, costs about $60. In general, um, you know, if, you, if they're going down, if uh, anchor damage to the site, um, you uh, will get dissatisfied clients and, and of course people share um, their dissatisfaction quite rapidly. So, um, so really it's important to make sure that the quality of the, of the experience and service matches the, the price for what you're getting. Okay, thanks David. Um, there's a question, so this is about arrival and departure taxes. Um, the person that's been, uh, this questioner has been told that this is a non-starter in some U.S. jurisdictions due to legal issues at airports. Is that a real thing or just naysayer verbiage? Oh, uh, that I don't know. Um, they're, they're, you know, um, so when you buy an air, airplane ticket, you got all kinds of taxes. Um, I don't know if people remember, but you used to be charged departure taxes and things like that when it, when you left countries and things like that. It was always a hassle. And so they've put all those taxes onto um, the airline tickets so you don't really see them. But I am sure that there are numerous regulations around uh, what can go on an airline ticket. And uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with, uh, with if there's special uh, new rules in the U.S., um, but that's definitely part of your, your scoping analysis. You want to look into that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, the question, what mechanisms do you suggest for situations where tourism fees in all forms are not enough to cover the costs? Blended finance? Um, and what are the best controls to avoid locking in tourism numbers to cover the costs? Right. So there was a question there earlier to try to. Uh, sorry about that wind. Hopefully, uh, hopefully it's not too bad. Um, the there was a question earlier about you know trying to make sure that tourism is not, you know, like making revenue from tourism is is not causing too many tourists to come just to make revenue to to, to cover the cost of the protected area or the site. Um, this is really important. You know, the the most common sourcing of uh, for protected areas, for example, it comes from governments. So governments um, uh, 
provide through budgeting to protect the dairies agencies um, annual operating costs and um, improving how you manage those uh, those budgets, improving you know how you're asking for money and, and lobbying to make sure you get enough money is one great way to do that. Obviously, donor financing, cultivating relationships with with uh, with uh, multilateral or, or um, bilateral international donors. Now, blended finance. Um, yeah, and I, and I did not mention, I did want to mention that, that there's an emergence, uh, the emerging tools of, of, uh, of green bonds, and in this case, blue bonds, are really worth looking into for tourism development. The problem is bonds are, are um, they're, they're, tend to be large scale, um, and um, you would need to, say, finance an entire country's uh, protected area, tourism infrastructure in protected areas with a bond. But that's definitely an interesting possibility that should be explored. Otherwise, um, there are uh, impact investors that are looking um, to make uh, positive investments in, in nature. And these could be um, everything from angel investors and local investors, you know, real estate people, to, um, to some of the larger funds like uh, Morova and, and others who are looking for opportunities to invest in the uh, and, and projects that provide a financial return as well as a, an impact uh, for the environment, a positive impact for the environment. And blended finance, the, the term is, is, is a great one. It's something that, um, where you combine grants and, and investment, and uh, this is uh, something worth exploring uh, for sure. Okay, thank you, David. I'm trying to be relatively quick. I know this is quite a, quite a number of answers, uh, quite a number of questions. Um. I, a question, I, you may have sort of already gotten to this, but uh, which finance tools would be best to fund res restoration of corals before perhaps funding can be sought from tourists? Mm. Yeah, so that was, um, that I did uh, skip over that. Someone asked that earlier. Um, coral restoration, from my understanding, the, the you know, most common way to fund that is through through grants, um, there is, um, and then there's of course, um, you know, as I mentioned before, volunteerism. There's a great opportunity to um, to get uh, people to contribute their time. They uh, they feel like they're really doing something. You can combine um, restoration with uh, with learning to dive, things like that, um, or you know, taking dive courses. Um, there's a uh, very innovative approach uh, that's being developed around insurance and. Um, this is uh, in the uh, Katana Roo, uh, Mexico. Um, they're working with, uh, this is TNC that's working with uh, hotel owners and looking at, um, uh, and working with the insurance company, I believe it's Swiss Re uh, Reinsurance, and um, I've identified ways to encourage restoration and finance restoration um, through different insurance products. Um, because the uh, a resilient reef uh, protects the hotels from storm damage, for example, and uh, um, so there's there's emerging opportunities there. It's still early stage to know whether that's going to be successful or not, but it's worth keeping an eye on. Okay, great. Thank you, David. Um, and can, can you flip back to your previous slide about your report? Um, the okay, oh. yeah, sure. Your report, um, the guide, the, the guide, the, um, yeah, sorry. early on. Yeah, yeah. Um, there okay. has been there's there was a question of where someone could find examples of success cases where they could see the methodology used, etc. So I just wanted to make sure everyone had this, the link for this, uh, or knew about this. Um, are there any other resources that you would suggest? Um, yeah, um, I would. Um, Melissa Walsh at the Pacific Ocean Finance Program has uh, put together a very interesting list of, um, of existing finance solutions um, and some links to, to them. So there are different case studies um, and that can be found um, if you, probably if you just Google Pacific Ocean Finance Program um, and look for uh, there's there's the catalog um, of, of finance tools that, that comes from the Biodiversity Finance Initiative, Biofin, that, that Melissa has on the site there. But there's also um, this, a list. I'm not sure what it's under, but um, if someone 
can look that up. They, it's, it's, it's not obvious, but there's a really great list there and it's worth looking at. And it has really good examples and a lot of it's um, around the Pacific. Um, so a lot of it has, it pertains to coral reefs. Okay, thank you. Um, and we got a sort of similar question from a, a two different people. And so I think that'll be our last question. But um, uh, so one is what tools, I'll read them both to you. And there, there's some, they're not quite the same question, but what tools work best in areas with a well-established tourism economy that already have a large MPA like the Florida Keys? Are there examples of shifting an existing economy to better support an MPA? Um, and then there was also a question, how do you visualize the financing mechanisms discussed working in an area which traditionally has a heavy tourism structure with established fees, et cetera, uh, but which are not currently contributing to MPA management, but to, to other sectors? So it's sort of about how do you shift to supporting an MPA if there's already a, a, an established tourism, but it's not necessarily supporting that MPA? Um, yeah, no, really, really great questions. Um, you know, one of the, the, the biggest challenges is making sure that the, the fees that are collected uh, are used for conservation and the, um, you know, standard in, in this case is to try to make sure that those fees are retained at the local level or at least at minimum at the protected area network level and don't go straight to government treasury um, where often they, um, they don't come back in a timely manner, management's not incentivized, um, by the you know tourist tur tourist satisfaction and things like that, um, where you have where you have very strong tourism operations already, um, it's really important to we, we found it's very important to document the economic value of that tourist industry and the in terms of jobs and in terms of, uh, of, of revenue and, and you know talking where the places where hard currency is important. Um, you know, documenting that and then using that information to to build a commitment from politicians and from from lawmakers that that are responsible for budgets to to make sure that uh, um, that adequate budgets are allocated to conservation and that um, laws and regulations are put in place uh, to control harmful tourist activities. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if I, I covered both questions. What, what was the room on the first question? Yeah. Well, they were both they were both sort of getting at the same thing as if it, if you you already have that tourist economy and you already and but the the it's sort of transitioning to also supporting the the MPAs. Yeah. Established MPAs. Um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, 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 in many cases it depends on the what the the laws are and um, you know within the laws if there are you know if you if entrance fees have to go to treasury for example maybe there are uh, ways to establish a. Concessions that where, where revenue can be retained locally or um, other types of uh, you know partnerships with the tourist uh, eight, um, tourist associations. Often, hotels have associations that promote their interests, and and partnering with them um, can result in in many cases you have uh, these associations have uh, established foundations that can contribute uh, voluntarily. Things like that. It, it's, there's, there are a lot of opportunities when you have tourism there, as, as long as you, um, you know, try to work with these, the stakeholders closely. Okay, great. David, can you now flip back to the final slide of, for the forum, the Reef Resilience Network Forum? Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know, thank you. Lots of people contributed to um, sort of the chat resources and um, contact information. And I would highly suggest that everybody move over to the Reef Resilience Network Forum to continue the discussions that have started in the chat, um, as well as answer uh, the sort of be discussion of some, some new topics. But anyway, um, I'd encourage that. And uh, thank you, everyone. D David, this was a great presentation. Obviously, tons of interest and questions around it. We so appreciate you doing it, including David's doing it twice. I want to thank everyone for listening as well. It's uh, a pleasure. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, again, from us, too, uh, for, for coming today. And so I, I hope uh, there's some thriving conversation on the, the, the Reef Resilience Network Forum after this. So thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.